Welcome everybody to this workshop today where we want to look at how the carbon market provided the model for a much wider financialization of, of elements of nature like biodiversity, like species, like water, even like the beauty of nature are being turned into, into assets that can in the process or in a later stage be traded at financial uh, exchanges. In the workshop today we want to look at the different stages in that process that are already visible and what we can learn from the carbon market uh, for, for these new trends. But first let's look a bit at the beginning. How did it happen that payment for environmental services um, became trading in ecosystem functions? Um, very subtle change, um, a change that's also used by a lot of proponents of using market-based mechanisms of putting a price on nature to justify this change. A lot of the discussion is about payment for environmental services, um, a model, a scheme that's pretty well established, particularly in some key Latin American countries, from Mexico to Costa Rica to Brazil. A long history um, of payments for so-called environmental service protection and a long history also of dependence that those instruments have created amongst some of the more progressive social forces in those countries. Um, so it is very difficult to show how, this, how the change is happening in the context of those who want to see the change from payment to trading happening and using, I believe, very skillfully and very, very knowingly um, the concept of payment for e um, ecosystem services to introduce what really isn't only payment but is trade. There are three <coughs> different stages of payments for environmental services. They have some similarities and they have some differences. Why is it important to have a quick look at them? I think because um, <coughs> the scheme or the, the, the concept of, carbon, uh, of, of payments for environmental services is used so much to justify the amplification, uh, amplification of carbon trading. Um, and it's very difficult to have a conversation with organizations that we would maybe see as natural allies in our analysis, um, who surprisingly aren't always allies in this, in this analysis because of their experience with payments for environmental services schemes that have benefited parts of their constituency. And therefore, I think it's worthwhile to spend some time in understanding where the different phases of payments for environmental services have similarities and where they are different so that we can have a, a conversation, a dialogue with those organizations to make visible what's changing there, um, what's being sold as a payment for environmental services isn't really a payment for environmental services as they imagine it in their heads. Um, the first is payment for environmental services schemes. Um, say a farmer protects a part of, a, of an intensively used field and lets wildflowers uh, grow. We had that, this sort of wildflower program in the, in the EU under the common agricultural policies for many years. Um, a farmer is compensated through a payment for environmental services scheme to not plow over the entire field. The source of the funding is public money um, and it is for achieving a public policy. Um, so reducing the loss of biodiversity, um, for example. Generally, they use public funding or community funding. Generally, they are for achieving a public good or a a um, condition that's in the public interest and they support the implementation of, of a public policy. Um, in the next step, there is a set of, um, of initiatives also called Payment for Environmental Services, but those involve private entities, um, generally large companies like Coca-Cola, Nike, so on and so forth, where two things change the motivation and the set of actors. The motivation changes because it's not primarily anymore the achieving of a public policy that's driving the payment. 
it's a company reputation that's driving the mo that's the driving motivation for the payment. That can either be because the company finds it cheaper to to pay for some maintaining of ecosystems um, in in exchange for destroying um, a habitat somewhere else, um, or or in the same place, or it is um, a payment to buy acceptance for overuse of water, for example. In contrast to the next category of payments for environmental services, which are trading, the second category that already involves private actors um, and companies, basically, um, it's not a compensation. In other words, those payments for environmental services, by and large, are not yet justifying the company violating a law and still being able to say, but I'm in compliance with the law. In this third category, which is what we are starting to see now, that changes, and that is the one fundamental big change. Um, in this new type of payment, in inverted commas, for environmental services, the payment involves a trade, involves a trade-off, if you want. Trading, um, destruction in one place with a compensation in another place. That means a company can say, I expand my mining area, even if it involves destroying a protected area, because <coughs> I'm protecting some other protected area or an area that has the potential <coughs> to become a protected area somewhere else. And still the mining company can claim to be in compliance with the law. So with this new category of payments for environmental services, which really are not payments, for me they are trade in ecosystem functions, there is a justification to continue an activity that the law otherwise would pr uh, prevent or not permit. And I can still continue with this activity without having to pay to to, ha to face the risk of paying a fine for violating the law. That is very different from the other two categories. I think to, to explain these two kind of compensation, we can just use the case uh, when you are, um, when you broke your leg on your um, <coughs> work time in an industry, in a plant, you will have a compensation mm -hmm. coming from the, the owner of the industry are coming from the um, state providence. But it doesn't mean that your leg is worth <laughs> yes. the money you will have in compensation of the <laughs> damage. Yeah. And so we, we just it. have to put yeah. the same kind of uh, <coughs> distinction of compensation with nature. Just putting yeah. a price on nature debate actually was taking place before carbon markets took off. It's older than 10 years. Um, but it did not find an outlet, it did not find the public platform to really take off. It was confined to a relatively small academic circle um, and it was confined to relatively small niches um, in the environmental legislative context. But it never really took off. Carbon trading, the, tra the, the discussion about putting a limit on environmental pollution in the form of carbon dioxide, provided the public space and maybe more importantly the policy space and the academic space to accelerate very, very quickly um, this discussion. There's a lot of cynicism in the discussions today, I think way too much. And you know, what is a cynic? A cynic is somebody who knows the price of everything but the value of nothing. And that is exactly where this discussion is going. Value that communities put on an intact forest, values that communities put on an open space that's communally used, values that the community puts on clean drinking water are not recognized. They're there. They are values that exist, that have long, long, long existed and that have never really gone away. It's those values that are being ignored in today's decision-making processes that are being substituted for a value, um, a monetary value, and I think the difference between the singular and plural is very important to realize 
as well. The turning of a multitude of different values into one price. How that is being done is anybody's guess. Um, it is not simple. Even academics who like to do this exercise have realized the obstacles and the technical difficulties, but there is a very clear intention to turn these impossibilities of, of reducing um, all these values into one price um, into technical difficulties that with enough academic expertise somehow will be, will be solved. Payment for environmental services and to a limited extent trading of environmental services has already been going on at this limited scale for quite some time. There also is academic literature, very critical academic literature already pointing out the impossibilities. One of the people who has looked at this in, in detail and uh, documented the impossibilities is Morgan Roberts, um, who is also very good at finding good titles for his work. Um, one of them um, is called um, Discovering Price in All the Wrong Places. Yeah. How do you discover the price of a running river um, and the qualities and the values that that has for the local communities? Another article worthwhile reading, and it's in the, in the notes that I'll send around, is um, the nature that capital can see. And that also comes back to the same, to the same issue. It's not that nature isn't visible. Um, it's you know, this whole discourse about there is a need to put a price on nature. Well, it could also be that capital needs to understand how, how nature functions and that you can't put a price on it. But instead, the, the discourse is the other way around. A price is put on nature so capital can see nature. I, I don't reject this argument that uh, price makes things visible. Of course it makes things visible. Mm. Uh, but it makes things visible in a certain way. It makes certain aspects mm. of this um, ex ecosystem function, which was reconceptualized as an ecosystem service, it makes some aspects of this visible, but always at the expense of making other aspects invisible. In the third um, aspect, the, the state is the necessary provider of the regulatory demand. If there weren't a environmental legislation that would limit the company's possibilities to do what it wants to do, there would be no incentive to engage in a trade of ecosystem offsets. So the state first creates the demand, but then very much takes a back seat um, and lets the companies engage and interact directly with communities to fulfill um, or to, to sort out how that demand is, is um, fulfilled. Michael Grubb um, of the Carbon Trust in the UK, one of the big promoters of carbon markets, um, has become a little disillusioned. Um, but that disillusionment is turned into um, calling others naive who thought that the carbon market would provide something else than what it does. I think his quote is very, very spot on in the sense that it says, if you, in, if you create a carbon, if you crea create a market-based instrument, to expect that it does something different than what a market-based instrument does, is a little naive. Then either you haven't understood what the, what the mm, instrument results in, or you've been really naive. Um, so if you create a market fundamentally, it will behave like the way that, carbon, that markets do, and it will chase uh, where there are the most effective things. That's exactly what carbon offset markets have done. Um, they have gone not where the development dividend is the biggest, they have gone where the financial dividend is the biggest. And as we've seen with the carbon market, the, the primary objective in the case of the carbon market climate protection becomes secondary. When you listen today to a lot of the discussions around maintaining or saving the carbon market, uh, climate change or halting climate change very rarely is, is mentioned as a primary objective. The objective has changed, switched, to maintaining the trading in this new asset in carbon. Um, just a quick example, uh, like you were mentioning, you know, the, the issue is no longer, um, like the climate discourse isn't even there. 
Um, I was in an event organized by the government and the representative, the president of the National Confederation of Industries said it very clear. Um, we're not talking about climate. We're talking about finance and economics. So, you know, even they are saying it. If we can't um, incorporate it, then I think, you know, the naive thing is not so far. The time that carbon dioxide will interfere in the atmosphere with the climate um, before it circulates somewhere else is a hundred years. So 99 years, a hundred years, is really the minimum time for which the offset has to be guaranteed. Um, and this has been one of the issues around forest carbon. Who can, who can guarantee that the forest will be standing for 99 years from now on? If it doesn't, where's the climate benefit? Um, if it does, if you do do a contract with the time frame of 99 years, forgetting for the moment the difficulties and impossibilities of guaranteeing that, what does that mean for the community? They are selling away the right for at least one, if not two generations, to determine land use in the future. So today's generation would be determining the land use for the next two generations. It's really a, a no-win situation. Either the climate loses because the, the, the offset does not guarantee, in inverted commas, guarantee <coughs> the protection for the time period that's needed from a climate perspective. Or if one tries to do that with a carbon offset, the time frames are so long that no community really sensibly could, uh, could agree to a contract like that. A hundred years, two generations. The question of how those contracts will be enforced over such long periods of time is another one that sort of from the more technical aspects, for me these are technical aspects in the discussion and I'm not suggesting that they should be a core for us, but I think in the discussion with organizations who see value uh, in payments for environmental services schemes, these technical aspects are important aspects to consider because they change how, um, how these payment for environmental services schemes are delivered. Uh, the second or another aspect to consider, of course, is the question of what happens with the monitoring after the project uh, contract runs out. Many of those contracts, as mentioned, uh, last for 20, maybe 30 years. But who will be there in 20 years' time to continue to monitor what happens with that contract after the 20 years? In the voluntary carbon market, we already see that um, projects appear and disappear all the time. Companies even appear and disappear uh, all the time. Uh, in that reality, it's just an illusion to believe that there will be continuous con uh, and constant monitoring of or tracking of, of those offset projects for, for these long periods of time. Uh, that just won't happen. One last point that I want to come back to also in the, uh, when we talk about the implications for democracy as we know it today is that for 20 years or so, environmental NGOs have been campaigning and social NGOs have been campaigning to look at the impact created by large infrastructure projects, by effluent and so on and so forth, not only as having an environmental impact, but also having a social impact. Um, any large infrastructure project does not only destroy habitat, it also impacts on the quality of life of the people along the road. Biodiversity offsets or biodiversity compensation separates those impacts again because there is no such thing as social offsets. All that's being talked about is offsets that address the environmental impact. There is no nothing that could compensate for the social impact. And yet the discussion is, is done as if those two were separable and even more so, with the possibility to trade, there also is a geographical separation of the impact and the, the um, supposed offset or compensation measure that may, in some limited cases, work for environmental impacts. It will never work for social impacts because the social impact is 
in replace and you can't offset it somewhere else. Um, so those who have the impact to their quality of life and the loss of habitat without any possibility to use environmental legislation to say but this is too much and above the law <coughs> have lost because the company will say no but we offset from the perspective of the community that's faced with the infrastructure project with the coal plant with the new stadium for some mega event has lost all of those possibilities they have kept the impact and they've got nothing from the compensation mechanism because that compensation mechanism pretends that it's possible to have this geographical separation between impact and compensation. So we're losing 20 years of, of advance in acknowledgement that social and environmental impacts are not separable. Offsets separate them and ignore that there is, not only separate them, but ignore that there is a social impact. 